my message today is simply titled, You Have an Assignment. You have an assignment. Suddenly, all the university students, anyone studying, went, oh, no. I didn't come to church for this. I've got assignments. You're reminding me of my assignments. I took a study break just to be here. And now you're telling me I have an assignment. Yes. But here's the good news. It is a unique assignment and I am not going to be marking your assignment. Good news. You don't have to hand it in. Uh, it's just actually the, the assignment is the God assignment that he has given you to live out for him. And we can look at a number of examples of this throughout God's word, the Bible, but we'll start in Matthew chapter four, verse 18, very simply, where Jesus speaks to some of the guys who would become his first followers, his first disciples. These are guys who were fishermen, but Jesus speaks to them and in a sense challenges them to live their life at a different level, speaks to them to say there's an assignment for you. So let's look at it in Matthew 4, uh, verse 18. It says that Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Verse 19, come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Now you can read other gospels and get a whole lot more to the story of what happened there. But what this condensed version by Matthew is saying is that you guys, uh, in Jesus' uh, moment here, Jesus is saying, you guys have been living here, but there's a greater assignment. And, and, and it's wonderful what you've been doing, but there is more that I've called you to in regard to how you live your lives to affect people. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus challenges them right at the start of their journey that they are called to be fishers of men, to, to live lives for, for uh, impacting the lives of men. And then right, let's look at the final words of Jesus in Matthew 28. Uh, so they were the beginning words. Now let's look at Jesus' final words because it's always interesting to see what the words were at the beginning and then what are the words at the end. And in Matthew 28, verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples, so uh, Simon Peter was there, the, James was there, John was there, this, the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And then he goes up to heaven, which I always find just a little bit humorous that he goes, I'm with you always and then leaves. <laughs> so there's a lot <laughs> going on there. But here, here we see this final statement that Jesus makes. He's thinking, okay, this is it. We've got to bring it home because I'm leaving these guys. Now the Holy Spirit is going to come. And yes, I will be with them, but not in the bodily form that I have been. So I need to get some really important words to them. And essentially, he says the same thing he says at the start, but he just expounds on it a little bit more. You've got an assignment. Don't just live below it. Don't just live for yourselves. Live for others. Make disciples. I'm with you and I'm giving you authority. But essentially he's saying to the guys, you're more than fishermen. That's wonderful that you have that craft. That's wonderful that you, you, you've been able to do that. But there's more to you than that. And God, I believe, says the same to every one of us that there is more to you than just what you do. There is a heavenly assignment that he has given each and every one of us. 
And as we start to understand what that looks like, it fuels our connection with God because we start to go on this journey of following Him, of this God assignment, and we recognize, yes, I I may have a natural responsibilities and a a career and, 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 and a family to raise and all of these things, and that's all part of what God's called me to, but there's more that He has for me as a follower of Jesus in the way I live my life and the way my life affects the lives of others. Now, we've spoken... Uh, around how we as a church have a very clear mission and it's three pillars and I'll just put it up on the screen again because I think it just helps us to go okay what are we what are we all about here why are we showing up on a Sunday morning why do we encourage people to come to a conference why do we talk about um, love thy neighbor as in you know helping and serving others why do we encourage you to be in a small connect group. Why do we do that? Well, we have a very clear, simple little mission. It's on the right-hand side on the screen if you're in the building. How cool is that? And look what I, what I can do. Let's see if we can get this right. I can actually push that away. <laughs> there we go. And then I can pull it back. Let's pull it back. <laughs> wow. It's amazing. Let's just leave it there where it is, right there. Three things that it says that we're about. Purpose-filled Jesus followers. It's not just a social gathering. We're purpose-filled Jesus followers. We're following after Jesus. We're getting to know Jesus. Some of you are brand new to this, and you're like, well, I, well, I love what I've read, but I, I want to know Jesus more. That's the journey we're all on, following after Jesus. The, the disciples started with this simple, okay, we'll follow you, and then went on this journey of getting to know who Jesus was and how he was calling them to live. But more than that, there's a purpose. So that's the first thing. The second thing is our lives are not called to live individually, but God always puts us in communities. We call it the church. You see community right throughout God's Word, the Bible. You see it in the Old Testament. God had His people in community, not in isolation. You see it in the New Testament, in the concept of the church, that God puts people in community. So we talk about healthy church communities. We want to be in a community together that's healthy. It's not perfect, but it's healthy in the way it operates. And finally, what do we want to be as we see in our mission is to be about significant, sustainable social impact. What does that mean? That we're outward focused. We're not just a group that lives for what we get out of this. We actually live for how we can impact the world around us. They may never thank us. Uh, They may or may not appreciate what we do, but we don't do it for their applause. We do it because in our hearts we believe that that is how God designed us, to to do good works for the glory of God. So it's an outward-focused mission. It's it's about me growing inwardly as a uh, uh, purpose-filled follower of Jesus. It's about me growing in community, and then it's about me outwardly affecting the world around me. So with all of that, what's your purpose? What's your assignment? And here's the thing, it's always unique. It's different for every one of us. I'll take you a little bit of the journey of mine. I've, I've shared some of it before. We, we heard earlier Jesse talking about how he went to Hillsong College and how it impacted him and there's an open day coming up and you should check it out. I went to, uh, I, I studied at university uh, and uh, University of Western Sydney Shout out alumni. Before that, I went to Castle Hill High School. Castle, that's right. Just down the road from Castle Towers, opposite Castle Hill RSL Club in Castle Street, Castle Hill, where there is no castle. If you can find it, let me know. I have not seen it. So I went to university, did a, University of Western Sydney did a, uh, a business degree, but while I'm there, I felt God stirring me. You know, you're kind of like, what, what, what's my purpose? What am I? And, and I felt God stir me about uh, hearing, a, hearing a, a, a speaker, preacher, someone on a platform like this say, 
How long are the best minds going to go to IBM or Coca-Cola or these big multinational companies? When will some of the best minds go towards building the church? And I remember hearing that and thinking, maybe I should give the best of what I have to build the church. I've done this degree, but I don't know if that's what I should be doing right now with my life. And so at that point, Donna Crouch, who at the time was running our youth ministry, said, hey, we're starting an internship. You can come and serve in the youth ministry and we'll connect it with the Bible College, which at the time was called Power Ministry School. I have a diploma from PMS. They shortened it. it marketing team was not up to speed. That's why we're now called Hillsong College. <laughs> it's just beginning, guys. People weren't thinking about those things. They're just, let's start something. It'll be great. So I, I was like, okay, I, I think I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this internship, be involved in the youth ministry, and, uh, and, and do Bible college part-time and, you know, do all of that. And so I, I start that journey, and Donna says, hey, we've got a need in the 12 to 16 age group. That's where we need someone to help us. We, we had one youth group. We weren't into the different age groups, which we have now. And uh, so we need to separate it up and be more effective in reaching this younger group, 12 to 16-year-olds. Phil, would you be interested in that? And I said, no. <laughs> they are punks. I know it sounds harsh, doesn't it? It's just how I felt at the time. I was like, I don't think I want to work with them. I don't work with the 17, 18 year olds. That that'll be that felt more where I'd like to be. And Donna said, Well, we've got a real need here. And I remember literally going home and praying about it and feeling like God said, if that's where the need is, that's where I want you to serve. And and so I went, I went back to Donna and said, okay. I'll do it. I'll start working uh, and, and let's look at what we can create for these 12 to 16 year old young people. Now, here's the thing. For some of us, we believe our God assignment has to be something that we feel really comfortable in. I did not feel really comfortable working with 12 to 16 year old young people at the time, but I felt that that was the next step and I was committed to being obedient on that journey. And so I just want to encourage you that sometimes we're waiting for the perfect assignment to fit together in every way. It doesn't usually work like that. There's a nudge, there's a step, and then you start on the journey. Uh, I, I wrote in my notes, our God-given assignment always begins with a step of obedience. It always begins with a step of obedience. And you've got to understand that that is always going to be part of your journey, that you, God kind of puts it out there and says it's up to you to take it up. I wasn't exactly clear on the details, but I was obedient to the prompting of God. And I want to encourage you in the same manner. Now, some of you know this, some of you, this is kind of a little bit of maybe revision, but maybe for some of you, there's a new assignment. Because what I've realized is that one assignment leads to the next assignment. <laughs> and, and I never fully knew that saying yes to this one assignment, okay, I'll do the internship and, 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 and all that was associated with that and then start serving with these 12 to 16 young people, I didn't know where that would lead. But one step of obedience an assignment from God leads to the next one. As you go on this assignment, there are things that you will have to confront. And so I want us now to go to the Old Testament of the Bible and consider one of the, the greatest leaders there was of God's people, and that is a guy named Moses. And we're going to consider three things that Moses had to deal with as he went on his assignment. Now, you could, again, uh, consider how these also were what the disciples had to deal with as they went on assignment. 
uh, with Jesus, but we're going to use Moses because there's some pretty clear examples of what he had to deal with and what he had to confront. And as you go on your God assignment, as you step into not just being a church attender, but someone who says there's a real purpose and I'm slowly stepping forward into that, or maybe I've been on assignment, but God, I feel like there's something new you're taking me into. These are the things that I believe all of us have to deal with and confront because I've had to in my own life. Now, let me just give you a little bit of the history of Moses, his story in a very, very short uh, segment. Many of you know this, but Moses is born at a time where the Hebrew people, and he's born into a Hebrew family, are living under Egyptian rule. The Egyptians are in control, okay? He's a Hebrew, okay? The Egyptian pharaoh, that's the king, the guy in charge, is really getting concerned that the Hebrew people are getting too strong, okay? If it was in politics today, it's like one political party is going, man, these guys are getting a big, uh, you know, power base. We've got to do something to get rid of them uh, and deal with them. So pharaoh is really concerned about the Hebrews. So what does he do? Well, he actually mandates a genocide. He says, all the boys, two years and under, have to be killed. Pretty horrible. Uh, But we still see things like this happen around the world. Maybe not to that extent, but there have been more recent examples of these kind of things because people want power and control. Pharaoh wants power and control. Moses' mum is a smart woman, and what she does is she doesn't want her son killed, and so she makes a little basket of reeds And she puts her son in a basket of reeds and is aware, it would seem, that Pharaoh's daughter bathes down in this particular river in in the Nile and sends Moses down, lets the son go, hoping that somehow he'll survive. Well, sure enough, this little basket of reeds with a baby in it floats by Pharaoh's daughter, She sees the baby, sees it's one of the Hebrew children and says, I want to look after him. This is a God moment. And then she says, find someone who can raise him. So they find the mother and she is able to raise her son in Pharaoh's house. Incredibly unique set of circumstances. Here's what I want to say to everyone here. You look at your life and sometimes think it's not fair. Let me tell you, the unique circumstances somehow happened in a way that enable you to be more effective in your God assignment. I I just want to say that because some of some of us think our past is literally our, our, you know, it's 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 hamstrung us. It stopped us. No, God uses all of that to make you better at handling the assignment He has for you. He teaches you a whole lot through it. So don't ever think it's wasted. Don't ever use it as your excuse. Moses in a unique set of circumstances that God is going to use. Gets raised in Pharaoh's house, has this conflict on the inside because at some point somehow he understands He is a Hebrew, but he is raised in an Egyptian house with Pharaoh. He has access to all of this uh, privilege, and yet he sees that the rest of his people are being oppressed to the point where one day, as he is maturing into a man, sees some Egyptians beating up uh, some Hebrews, and and he kills them, gets involved, murders them. And then people become aware of it, and so what does he do? He runs away. He's a great, courageous man and runs away. That was a little joke. He was a really strong, courageous leader who runs away. And he runs out into the desert, basically. into the. the, He leaves everything, and there he ends up getting a new life, getting married, having kids, and in the back of the desert, God speaks to him. This is what I've realized, is that God can speak to you anywhere about your assignment. 
You can think you've run away from God. Guess what? He'll find you. (laughs) And he'll speak to you in ways that you know it's God speaking to you, as he did to Moses. Spoke to him through a burning bush, got Moses' attention, spoke to him about an assignment. And so Moses decides, okay, I will go on this assignment. The assignment from God for Moses is to set God's people, the Hebrews, free from this uh, Egyptian pharaoh and the oppression they're under. It's a pretty big assignment, absolutely crazy. And Moses says, all right, let's go. I'll do it. Grabs his family and says, we're going to head back to Egypt, obviously full of all kinds of feelings of nerves and all the rest of it. So here's the first thing that Moses had to deal with as he stepped forward on his assignment. Number one, Moses had to confront his insecurities and grow in confidence. Every time you step out on any form of assignment with God, there will always be insecurities and there will always be confidence that you have to grow in. We often ask ourselves the question, am I capable Do I have what it takes? Am I the right person for the job? And we can look at and consider all the reasons why we don't have what it takes. Moses does this. Listen, here's the thing. Moses could have stayed comfortably living in the back of the desert and, uh, and just said, no, God, I'm not interested. Uh, I don't want to do this. And I've got a life over here. He would never have had to confront the insecurities. If you don't go on the assignment, guess what? You never have to confront the insecurities. You never have to grow in confidence. You just keep living the way you were. But if you're going to step up into some kind of assignment from God, which I believe he's taking all of us on that journey to step up into, there will be things you have to confront within yourselves. Things you, 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 you look at and you think, I lack. And, and here's an example when Moses has a conversation with God as he begins this journey in Exodus 4 verse 10. It says, but Moses pleaded with the Lord, oh Lord, I am not very good with words. I never have been. And I'm not now, even though you've spoken to me. I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. Now that's not easy to say if you get tongue-tied and your words get tangled. Nonetheless... He said it. Then the Lord asks Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Here's what I love. I love when God speaks to you in a way that rebukes you and loves you at the same time. Have you noticed that God can do that? It's like, I love you, but get yourself in order. Then the Lord, as I said, asks Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether People speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see. Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will be with you as you speak and I will instruct you in what to say. God, like I say, rebukes in love. God doesn't have a problem with Moses being insecure, but he does have a problem with Moses not trusting him. It's okay to be a little bit insecure. It's okay to question your ability. It's okay to wonder, do I have what it takes? But it's not okay to not trust that God will be with you and God will enable you. God has put you in a unique place for a unique purpose and a unique assignment and He will grace you for it. Moses had all these insecurities, but he had to deal with it. He had to confront it. He had to develop in confidence. Second thing, Moses had to live according to a new, higher standard. Whenever you decide you're going on a mission, you're stepping into this God assignment, guess what? It is going to challenge certain things that were acceptable before. We see this again further on in Exodus 4. There's a confrontation between God and Moses. Moses has accepted God's assignment. Moses starts on the journey towards Egypt. And then there's this tiny little passage and you read it, you wonder what is going on when God wants to kill Moses. 
So let's have a read of this in Exodus 4, verse 24. It says, On the way to Egypt, at a place where Moses and his family had stopped for the night, the Lord confronted him and was about to kill him. But Moses' wife, Zipporah, Zippy to her friends, it's just in the transcript notes, took a flint knife and circumcised her son. Poor kid. She touched his feet with the foreskin and said, Now you are a bridegroom of blood to me. When she said a bridegroom of blood, she was referring to the circumcision. After that, the Lord left him alone. What is going on? Do you ever read the Bible and like, what just happened? Like, you, you speak to Moses, God, you challenge him. He says, yes, he's going, he's on the journey and you want to kill him. What is going on? See, what has happened that uh, scholars would suggest is that God has said to Moses, go on an assignment. But as soon as he steps out on that assignment, the standard changes. You're representing me. You're going to represent my people. Part of the covenant I've made with my people is a blood covenant that involves circumcision. You've neglected that. Now, that's okay if you stay in the desert with your family. But if you're going on the assignment, it's going to require something more of you. It's going to require you to deal with things that were acceptable before. They're not acceptable now. The God assignment is always going to challenge you to live at a different and a higher standard. And, and I, I've, I've just got to be honest with you. That's how it is. That when you choose to pursue the God plan for your life, there will be things that were acceptable before that you know you can't live like that anymore. You have to lay that down. You have to get rid of it. You have to cut it out of your life. You have to go through a journey of saying, that is not how I'm living because I got to live at a different level because of the God assignment for my life. And here we see this go on where Zipporah, who many would say was not even of Hebrew origin, circumcises her son because she knows they've got to change the standard that they've been living by. We're in. And God, if we're following you, we're all in. This is going to cost us something. And, and I'd love to say that, that it, you can stay how you are and go on your assignment, but I've just learned that every time it's cost me something, every time I've had to deal with certain things and go, okay, that was comfortable, but I can't live in that anymore. I've got to choose to live here now. And God does that to all of us. And the third thing that I'm learning, that I see in Moses, that I think we all have to deal with is Moses had to leave the people to be with God. Now, what does that mean? Well, we're with people all the time. Part of our mission is healthy communities. God puts us in communities. That's how we operate. But here's what I've learned, is that everyone has an opinion about everything. <laughs> and that's fine, but it's not always what God's saying. And we see this, and, and, I, and I put this in my notes, actually, you cannot allow the opinions of others to affect your God-given assignment to limit it or diminish it. Because that can happen if you listen to the people too much. In Exodus 24, 12, verse 12 onwards, it says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on this mountain. Stay there and I'll give you the tablets of stone on which I've inscribed the instructions and commands so you can teach the people. You've got to come up to where I am and you're going to have to leave the people for a bit. 
So Moses and his assignment, Joshua set out and Moses climbed up the mountain of God. Moses told the elders, stay here and wait for us until we come back. Aaron and Hur, who's a him, although his name's Hur, but he's not a Hur, he's a him. Aaron and Hur, who's a him, are here with you. If anyone has a dispute while I'm gone, consult with them. I've learned that I have to keep going back to God to hear clearly from Him about the assignment that He has for me. In fact, in Luke 5, we read about Jesus who was with people, who served people, who had these disciples who He was teaching and developing. Luke 5 verse 16, it says, But Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus prayed? Yeah. Jesus went alone to be with his heavenly Father because he's living in a fleshly body which has all kinds of fleshly desires and he has to go to be with God so he can stay on assignment for what God has called him to. We all have to keep going back to God while you're on assignment so that God can continue to refresh you and remind you what really matters. What are the priorities? What's this all about? And make sure your heart is right with Him. Because if you don't, you end up with what happens later on in Exodus 32. Moses puts uh, Aaron and her in charge and the people start going, hang on, we don't have a leader. Where's Where's, we, where's, where's Moses? Where, where's the God that we've been serving? He's not here. We need another one. And Aaron and her panic. Aaron panics. He's like, yeah, I don't know what to do. We better please the people. Let's make sure the people are pleased because we, 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 we don't want them to, you know, kind of like mount some kind of, uh, you know, insurrection or whatever against us. We, we better make sure that they know that we've, you know, we're listening to them. And so Aaron gets all this gold from everybody, melts it all down and makes a golden calf and says, here's your God, everything's okay. And then Moses sees what's going on, loses, loses it, comes down the mountain, can't believe what's happened. And I love Aaron's excuse. Aaron goes, well, um, like we just threw the gold into the fire and out came a calf. <laughs> so I don't even know how it happened. It just did. Like this whole passage to me has, is just so fascinating and a little bit comedic because then Moses goes, all right, well, I'll show you. Grind down the gold, grind down the gold, put it in jugs, give the people, uh, put it in cups or whatever and make them drink it. That's literally what Moses says. You have to drink the golden calf. And so they did and it was bad. When you don't keep listening to God and you assume you've just got to constantly do what the people say, you can lose sight of where the God assignment should take you. Now, we're all about loving people, serving people, doing what God's called us to do in leading and and loving and discipling people, but you personally can't be swayed by the opinion because it will happen everywhere all the time. Worship team can come and join me. I have had examples of this time and time again. I, I've shared examples of this time and time again. One of my uh, you know, significant examples is our assignment led us to South Africa. And for a number of years, in fact, I think it was April 6th, so just a couple of days ago, it would have been 16 years uh, that, that we went and arrived with our little family uh, with an assignment to start a church in Cape Town. And... I remember on that journey, we were looking for a venue. And I've told some of you this story before, and I felt this downtown convention center would be a great place to launch church. And so I talked to some people about it, as you do, because you're excited. You got ideas, you got dreams, you talk to people about your dreams. Sometimes people don't see the dreams the way you see them. 
Sometimes they haven't heard from God the way you've heard from God. And I remember talking to someone who was a pastor in the city and I'm like, hey, this is where I'm thinking about having church because it's downtown and then people from the north or the south or wherever could come and it wouldn't be one area over another and it's pretty central. And I remember him saying to me, that's an expensive venue. Do you think you could afford it? Maybe you should start somewhere smaller. And I, I was like, yeah, I, I, I guess you, you, maybe you're right. Maybe we're thinking too big. And, and then I met with a business guy uh, who I thought would be a big thinker and explained to him, hey, we're looking at this venue downtown. And, I, and he looked at me and said, are you trying to prove something by going there? And I remember thinking, maybe am I, am I doing this out of ego? Am I trying to prove something by going there? What's, what's the motivation of my heart? And all these things, you know, uh, start to get challenged and you start to think maybe that's not part of the God assignment. Uh, but then I also listened to another voice and that was the voice of my wife, which is very similar to the voice of the Holy Spirit of God many times. And all the husbands said, amen. And all the wives even louder said, amen. Yes, dear. They are helpful lines in a marriage. Yes, dear. And so my wife, I, I was talking to her. I was like, oh, maybe we're thinking too big. Maybe we shouldn't look at that. And she goes, well, what, why don't you just at least go and have a conversation? You haven't even talked. I talked myself out of this before I've even talked to the convention center people. I hadn't even been there. She's like, why don't you just at least go and talk to them? I said, yes, dear. So we went down, had an appointment, met up with this lovely lady there. And, uh, and, and this is, you got to understand, this is 2008. This is, we had church in London, we had church in Kiev, we, we literally had church in Sydney. Didn't have churches all around the world as we do now or across Australia. And, and uh, so I was thinking, I'm going to have to explain to her what we're trying to do. You know, we want to use the venue every week. It's not just a one-off. We want to have a church service in there and use it each Sunday. And, and she looks at me and she stops. She goes, no, it's okay. I know who you are. And I said, really? She goes, yeah, my, my brother went to London and he was away from God. And he ended up going to your church in London. And his life got radically turned around. And then she says, I'm a Christian. She says, I actually believe God got me this job so I can help you to have church right here. She was on assignment. She didn't even know it. And her assignment connected with our assignment. And then she said, and I'm going to make sure you get this for the cheapest possible price. Amen. God looks after all those details. But if I just keep listening to the people, sometimes I'm going to miss the God miracle on the assignment. So I want to encourage you in your assignment. There are things you're going to have to confront, but keep taking the next step in faith, trusting, knowing that God is with you. As a church community, we are taking the next steps together. And I, my final little note I put here is your God-given assignment has deep purpose, but it's always outworked in community. Our assignment in South Africa was to help build a community. Your assignment is an individual one, but it's always connected to the community of the body of Christ. However that looks, we need both of these elements working together. Moses' assignment was for the community to lead them out of their oppression. It wasn't just about him. It was about something much bigger. And it always is for all of us. Can we stand together? Let me pray for you. Father God, I just thank you that your word speaks to us, challenges us, encourages us. And reminds us that, Lord, you are in control. And our responsibility 
is to be obedient to you and to keep walking forward with steps of faith. Lord, I pray as we uh, have the courage to step into the assignment, to keep going on the assignment, maybe to step into the new assignment, that we would do it knowing that uh, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a whole lot of us uh, to confront some things. But Lord, we do, we do it with faith. We do it with faith, knowing you're with us and you're able. And so Lord, I just pray for people here who may be faced, faced with some challenges, uh, that they would have the courage to confront them and move forward. Just with heads bowed and eyes closed, uh, if, if that really spoke to you, that message in some way of maybe, um, you know, there's some insecurities and you're like, God, can you help me with these? And you've got to build in some confidence. Uh, you know, maybe that's a real thing. Maybe you, you just need to keep hearing from God because some voices have really started to restrict your faith uh, and you, you've got to move forward from that. Uh, or maybe, you know, you're someone who's going, you know what, God, I, I, I really want to, I want to serve you, but it just kind of seems hard with what I'm facing right now. You know, God is challenging you to live at a higher standard. And you're saying, God, can you help me to do that? If, the, if that's you with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to pray with you. I just Sometimes it's good to respond to what you're hearing today. Just lift your hand and let, let's pray. Amen. A whole lot of hands around the place. Other locations online, let us know. Other locations, just lift your hand. I just want to pray because I know this is very real. I've faced it on my own journey. I'm sure many of us have at different times. Lord, I just pray whatever the assignment, Lord, whatever it might be that people are facing, that they just have the courage, uh, Lord, where they need to, to continue to grow in faith and in confidence. Uh, and, and to know that you're going to give them the words, you're going to give them what they need. Lord, for others, that they would leave behind the things that are just going to hold them back. Lord, you're calling people to live at a higher standard. I pray we'd have the courage to, to do that and, and to keep moving forward in that with the way we live our lives. And for others, Lord God, that you would um, just help us to, to keep going back to you and let your voice be the central voice to what we listen to and what drives us and what motivates, what leads us forward. Lord, I pray your Holy Spirit, Lord, the God assignment, whatever it might be, Lord, I, I, I just get uh, excited in my spirit as people step forward into the assignment you have for them. Bless them, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. What an encouraging and inspiring message from Pastor Phil, and I hope that that was an incredible blessing to you. And maybe today you've never made a conscious decision to surrender leadership of your life over to Jesus. You've never stepped into not only the God assignment on your life, but literally the life that God has for you. You know, the reality is that all of us have made choices and decisions that have led us away from God's best. And God sent His one and only Son, Jesus, that whoever believes in Him would not perish, but could have everlasting life. Not just a life that starts once we die, but a life that starts right here, right now, the abundant life that God desires to give us. And in just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer together out loud wherever we're watching from. It's just a simple conversation with God where we acknowledge our need for Him and we surrender leadership of our life over to Him. And so if you're praying that prayer today, I want to encourage you to pray it out with all of your heart, wherever you're watching from. And we're believing for incredible life change. The Word of God says that when we make this decision to follow Jesus, when we invite Him into our lives, the old life is gone and the new life has come. That Jesus is birthing something new, something fresh inside of you. And so come on church, wherever you're watching from, let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you for this life. I thank you that it's a gift from you. Today I choose to follow you, to surrender my life to you, Jesus. Lord, I lay down my past. I lay down what has gone before and I choose to step into all you have for me. Jesus, today I surrender to you. I invite you to fill me with your love, to fill me with your Holy Spirit, 
and to help me live my life for you. God, I honor you, I love you, and I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, friend, if you made that decision today for the first time or whether it's a recommitment, we want to congratulate you. We believe it is the best decision that you could ever make. And we want to be able to help you get started on this journey. If you scan the QR code or click the link in the description, there is an incredible booklet that we want to be able to share with you. It's a great 21-day guide to help you get started on your faith journey. We want to encourage you to read it. Allow the Word of God to get into your spirit. Follow the instructions in the booklet. It's going to help you get started. And make sure that you're in the room next weekend as we kick off our Momentum Month. And we're believing that your life is going to move forward as you step into all that God has for you. And so church, we love you. We're so grateful that you've been with us today. God bless you guys. We'll see you in the room next weekend.